Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I've heard so much about this program, and it's, I've heard amazing, amazing things. Um, I've been sent a number of questions to answer and been asked to use the story of Teach Aids to answer those questions. Here is a picture of 500 girls receiving comprehensive AIDS education for the very first time. Over the last 30 years, we've done a lot of work and we've, we've come very far in the fight um, against HIV and AIDS, but still we have so far to go because sessions like this aren't happening as often as we need them to. And that's because there's still so many challenges with providing HIV and AIDS education both in India as well as around the world. Today I want to tell you about some of these challenges, ways to overcome them, and present to you the story of Teach AIDS. So in 2005, I started reading reports coming out of India that said that it was to be the next hot zone for people living with HIV, and that despite hundreds of millions of dollars that were spent on prevention efforts, that the awareness levels, the knowledge levels, were still really low. So I wanted to learn more about what wasn't working. I ran a study on 200 kids, and what I found was exactly the same that I was reading in these research reports, that people had basic questions about HIV prevention. Things like, can you get HIV from coughing or sneezing or hugging? The number one question that came out of the studies was around a cure. So to which stage can HIV be cured? Is there a cure? How come certain countries have the cure and other countries don't have the cure? And as you must know, there's, there's no cure. One of the major problems that we discovered was that the link between awareness campaigns and knowledge gains was broken. Talking about HIV meant talking about other sensitive topics like sex or intravenous drug use or death, which made it extremely difficult to talk about uh, openly. So unlike, say, uh, anti-smoking campaigns, a link between awareness and knowledge wasn't there. So increasing awareness didn't necessarily cause an increase in knowledge gains. This is a demonstration from a few years ago from a state called Uttar Pradesh. It's one of the largest states in India. And here they were burning sex and AIDS education materials. But the people who were doing the burning were the educators themselves who were given these materials to be able to teach in the classrooms. Sex education, it turns out, was banned across multiple states in India. And because AIDS education was taught as part of sex education, it was either watered down or not given. But even in places where it wasn't explicitly banned, like in this picture, often parents and teachers rejected it harshly. So the question was, could there be a better way? Is there a way to be able to imagine the way that we teach about taboo topics? And this is where my research began five years ago. And the first step was trying to figure out what the right balance, so what the strike, uh, how to strike that balance between comfort and clarity. So if you take a look at just this image here, these are actually images from HIV materials. If you look on the right corner here, the pictures are extremely comfortable to look at. They're stick figures, but you don't really understand what's happening here. Or on the other extreme up there, you've got medical illustrations uh, where you absolutely understand the clarity, but because of the kinds of images, it becomes either banned or immoral or people become uncomfortable with those images and then don't share them or stakeholders don't want to use them in the schools. So the question was, what kind of pictures do we use that are comfortable and also are clear and therefore optimize learning? So we started testing a bunch of different images. And here you can see the numbers at the bottom were how uncomfortable people were with these kinds of images. It turned out that they were based off of a number of medical illustrations from North America. And using pictures from here doesn't necessarily suit people in other, in other cultures. But what we discovered through additional research and multiple iterations was that we were just a few steps away from striking that right balance that I was telling you about. So for instance, here, the main issue was that there was too much of the woman's skin that was exposed that was making people uncomfortable. So instead, we could show a picture of a woman who was pregnant, and then through animation, she would have a baby in her arms. Or here, 
we borrowed a bunch of ideas from old Bollywood movies. So we couldn't show a couple kissing, but we could show them come very close to kissing, and then the camera pans up the tree and then the birds kiss instead. <laughs> so what we ended up doing was using this biology-based approach and coupling it with culturally uh, appropriate euphemisms like this. And as a result of all of this testing, what we found was that nearly 99% of the people who went through these materials felt extremely comfortable. And not just that, they were learning significant amounts, they were retaining significant amounts, their attitudes were changing in positive directions around issues of HIV and AIDS. And so what I did was I started posting this research up online, and we got an enormous response from the global community. What we found was that a number of governments, NGOs, and all kinds of interesting organizations around the world were writing and saying, this wasn't just a problem in India, this is a problem in our country too. Because of the high stigma levels, it's extremely difficult to talk about these subjects. How can we work together? So we started using the same iterative design process to be able to develop materials for those countries too. I actually learned that you are all designing prototypes for the tools that you're building as well, and that right now you're at that paper prototyping uh, phase, which is incredibly important. And we went through exactly that same type of th thing when we started uh, developing materials. Here are a few pictures from the production versions of the animations when we started working with governments and other NGOs. We wanted to make sure that the materials were truly culturally appropriate for all of the different uh, languages that we were developing in for the various countries. Here's a peek at our uh, business model. So we get funding from individuals as well as from foundations, and we get sponsorships from corporations who like to put their logos on the animation. So it could be on the CD-ROM cover, or it could be at the beginning of the animations. And then what happens is through a Creative Commons license, we make all the animations, all of the interactive software available for free to everyone. And so it's then available to, for free for organizations that are like religious religious organizations or governments or NGOs, and then what happens is they make copies in their countries of these materials. They can make a few dozen copies, but there are also places that are making literally thousands and thousands of, co of copies and giving it out to all these different organizations. I was also asked about whether partnerships were important to us, and the answer is absolutely yes. There's no way that we would be able to develop these materials without strong partnerships, whether they're governments that are then rolling out the program into schools, or whether they're NGOs that are finding all the different areas around the world where these people need it most to be able to give out this uh, material. In addition to having contract workers um, working on the different animations and the iterative design process, we have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers from all over the world who have come together to be able to make this happen and literally have donated thousands of hours of support towards these efforts, whether they were Stanford professors or celebrities or um, legal experts, even the office that we're in, which is very close to Stanford, is donated. So I wanted to be able to share with you a few stories around the world because I think that this is what inspires us to take action. And it also helps us learn more about our learners or our users. So this is a story of Dr. Paswal. He's a doctor in the Indian Army, and he wrote to us and said that he needed to be able to get HIV and AIDS education to his soldiers. And he said, I don't know very much about technology, and we don't have internet in the area where we need to display this. So he said, that's not a problem. We sent him our CD-ROM versions. And then he sends us this picture. There are 300 soldiers in this room watching the interactive versions of the Indian animations. But the story didn't end here. A bunch of educators came to him and said, we heard that you were giving this education, and we either feel extremely embarrassed or we feel like we don't know enough to be able to give this education to our kids. Can you help us? So he said, absolutely. So then he sends us pictures like this. So it's the same room, the same materials, the same Dr. Poswell in the front, but now it's filled with hundreds of kids. One of my other favorite stories comes from Kenya in a location where they're using the animations where they have no electricity. And here's how they're doing it. They're putting the software on the laptop, the laptop on a chair, the chair on top of the table, the table in front of the room for all of these kids to learn at the same time. And they're taking this to over 1,000 kids across 20 schools. And this is happening all over the world. We get incredible pictures like this. It's, in, it's really inspiring to see how people are taking action. 
In Rwanda, the people are using it in multiple ways. I thought this was really innovative. In 2010, when they had the World Cup Games, they had set up these gigantic screens in the villages and uh, where they were playing the soccer games. And uh, thousands of young people would come to watch them. And then in between a number of the games, they would play the Teach Aids animations. Last year in India, we had a huge victory when a number of the state governments started to approve our materials for the states, even in locations where sex education had been banned previously. And as a result of all this support, a number of celebrities came on board. They donated their voices, they donated their likeness. So here you can see that they're the avatars of the celebrity faces. Um, the response has been nothing short of amazing. In Andhra Pradesh, one of the states that has 84 million people, just a few years ago, HIV positive kids were expelled from their schools because of the fear and the stigma. But last year, that same state government not only approved the Teach Aids materials, but made 25,000 copies of them and distributed it through all of the schools and their counseling facilities. They even showed it on television on a few um, popular TV stations. In Botswana, 23% of the population is infected with HIV. But, the, but with the help of their um, former president, as well as some amazing NGOs that we worked with, and uh, UNICEF and their Ministry of Education, we were able to recruit a number of their celebrities. Uh, so in this case, they're uh, music artists. In fact, the guy on the top right there, he's a judge on East Africa Idol, so you can relate. So. Uh, they donated their voices, and just a few months ago, December 1st was World AIDS Day. They launched it nationally, and their permanent secretary has approved it for distribution across every single school in the whole country. So those are just a few of the many stories that we receive um, about how people are using it and making incre an incredible difference and how a small idea can turn into something that's now in uh, 70 countries. So with that, I'd actually leave, want to leave you with this, which is that as you embark on this new journey, it's incredible how young you are. It's incredible all the technology and all the people and all the resources you have at your fingertips. Just to remember that it's so important to understand the problem and to truly understand the people and the need of the people that you are developing for. And to just think of it as a blue sky and try to reimagine your solutions. Thank you.